And here's a song for that one special person. Late in the evening She's wondering what clothes to wear She puts on her makeup She brushes her short black hair And then she'll ask me Do I look all right? And I said, no, biatch You look horrible tonight Don't go anywhere, Vicky Don't go anywhere You're gonna want to hear this Because the world wants to sing it to you Use all your power Waste everybody's time You dress like a hooker <laughs> Not the expensive kind <laughs> So get your ass to the airport Take a one-way because biatch <laughs> you look horrible tonight <laughs> I said biatch you look horrible tonight <laughs> hold on Vicky don't go because we want to sing you out. We'll sing you goodbye properly. We said, Biatch, you look horrible something um, I've, I've been thinking about. Um, so remember the uh, video uh, that Nirvana did in Bloom, um, where yeah, they, they, yeah, it was kind of a parody off of bands that used to play on Ed Sullivan, where yes. they made it all nice, but then they, half the video was them going nuts. Trash. Yeah. Like... Now, as a musician, yes. is, does a song sound different based on how you perform it? Oh uh, fuck yeah! Does a song sound different based on how you perform it? Yeah, because yes. when yeah, because you know when I uh, at the beginning when they're all clean cut, you know, and just dancing around like that, like the Beatles, you know, it, I, I can just imagine in Bloom sounding a lot different than you know what the ultimate result is. Right? Uh, would you be able to dive in a little? Bit? Yeah. So what I actually think is really neat about that video is it. Uh, I think follows the dynamic of the song. You have these huge drops, not in volume, but of vibe. So it's like, you know, you have that, that bass line, like throughout all the verses, and it does change when it gets to the, to the choruses, but it goes up in energy like 100%. As soon as you hear Kurt right before the, and he's the one, you, you hear Kurt ramp up to another person. Like, you, he starts at, you know, and he just turns it all the way up. That's what's so great is that it's that same pattern you get in the videos. You're seeing that that dynamic change. Mm. Uh, yeah, um, it's you can you can see an artist that you love kill a song that you love by performing it poorly. Yeah, because they kill what you that they almost disconnect like that that feeling that you had like that first time you heard it. Like, I, I never got the chance to see Aretha Franklin before she passed, and in a way, I'm kind of glad I didn't, because it makes it, it makes her that much more untouchable. Like, right. she was so amazing, and I didn't get a chance to see her, and like, um, because I know, oh, well, it, it may it may have elevated my experience, but it gives it this weird, like, reverie, and like, ooh. Um, but 
I'm trying to think of like a good example of when I saw a band I really liked and I was like, man, oh, thrice. I love thrice uh, and I've seen them a few times. Yeah. So when their guitar player Tepe was like really getting into equipment and like, I was definitely already on that. Like I'm a gear addict. Um, I love cool vintage stuff too. He, he brought one of these vintage Marshall amps and it was like, cool. But he dialed the gain back so much to make it sound like shiny and beautiful. It's like, well, you can't play Deadbolt with a shiny guitar. You have to have a huge metal sounding guitar because that's what the song fucking sounds. <laughs> and so I watched them play and I'm like, you know, I'm going to say <laughs> I'm really pissed right now. <laughs> Everything sounds really good. When I was sitting up, like, right in the front, and they did Kill Me Quickly, I could only hear Dustin's guitar. Perfect. Had plenty of distortion. The way he plays it, especially, like, the t- um, there's a good example. The type of amps that I really like are called Class A tube amps. The thing about that is they're very simple, based on circuits from, like, the 40s and 50s, like, uh, like uh, broadcast systems. Um, when you turn the volume up, it distorts more. It's that simple. So mm-hmm. it sounds fucking great. The other thing about that is if you pick softer, it will not distort. As you start to dig, it distorts. So you have that cool dynamic. Mm-hmm. Man, that dude was fucking tearing that guitar, and you could hear that amp barking back. And I was like, yes. <laughs> and then on the Tepe side, I was like, I'm just going to stay right here because I'm getting so pissed every time I look at it this way. I'm like, all oh, the drums. I'm like, killing it. He's so good. Like, <clears throat> um, Riley Breckenridge, their drummer, fantastic drummer, very methodical, but just always on point his brother uh which i think there's a neat connection there when siblings play in a band he's also the bass player uh eddie is his brother they're constantly in sync they can do such great stuff i'm like this is great that's great that's great you asshole you asshole (laughs) (laughs) turn up that gain right now before i jump this barrier turn it up punch you in the face take your guitar play the thing tell everyone that i took your place and thrice and my life is different all of a sudden (laughs) You know, but so yeah, oh, like man. by the way you play, it it really does have an impact. Like imagine acoustic guitar. If someone's gonna play like an acoustic version of a song that's electric, you I feel like you typically hear them really try and play the parts differently however they can, which is like on an acoustic you can play quieter mm. or louder, more technically, less technically. And so you'll hear how they kind of make those songs come to life. And you're like, whoa, even an acoustic version is really good. You're like, right, because they knew how their song is structured. And they knew a cool way to bring it back to life without all these amps. Where some people just like, "Mm," just like dig right into their guitar. You're like, this sounds like piss. (laughs) Stop it. It's like the Nirvana Unplugged uh, session. It's great. I didn't know a lot of their songs would translate to acoustic so well. Mm -hmm. But they do. You know, a Meat Puppet song on acoustic? Fucking great. Yep. Like, it's awesome. So, mm. uh, yeah, it definitely makes a difference. Speaking of Nirvana, uh, I went and saw Foo Fighters. Sick. Oh, man, I got backstage passes, and I fucking Sick. lost my mind. It was so great. And then uh, Dave Grohl played drums. He did a bunch of covers on drums, and he played a Nirvana song on drums, and it was fucking rad. That's awesome. Oh, my God. Yeah. That makes me very happy. Yeah. All right. What's your next one? Oh, wow. Uh, yeah. Back on um, Jimi Hendrix. For sure. Uh, that was one of those, like, I'm getting into guitar. Like, I'm in middle school. It's like, you kind of have to listen to Jimi Hendrix. Because mm-hmm. he's, like, the god. And that's one of those hype things. I'm like, is he really, though? And then I listen to it, and I was like, like, oh, yeah. Yeah, Yeah, that's very much true. He's from Uh, another planet. Not only that, a lot of people don't know that he plays left-handed. Yep. Mm -hmm. So he tilted a right-handed guitar, Mm -hmm. and like, because they didn't have left-handed guitars, really, at the time. He's also from the Northwest? Fuck yeah. Seattle, yeah. And I loved his prehistory before he hit a big, because he he was a session musician. Yep. Um, Did some work with the Isley Brothers. Did some work with Little Richard, but Little Richard fired him because Jimi Hendrix was too flamboyant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, Little Richard. You're stepping all over him. <laughs> it was just too much for me, honey. <laughs> You're like, 
<laughs> really? He was too much for you. This is before he was dressing like a captain of a ship sailing into the next dimension. <laughs> I it's need at least for you. 15 more rings and 30 more necklaces and a bouffant, please. But Jimi Hendrix is too much for me. <laughs> Mind blowing. Like, uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And, and he was a paratrooper uh, in Nam, yeah. which was nuts. Uh, That's where the song Purple Haze came from. Yeah. His exactly. time in Nam. And, and he caused such a ruckus with that song because, pe- like, especially back then, it was easier to mishear people's, uh, like, what they were saying. Totally. Uh, excuse me. <laughs> excuse me. Excuse me while I kiss the sky. Christians were like, he's saying kiss this guy. Uh uh-uh. uh. We gotta protest him. <laughs> we hate him. Play that back. Play that fucking yeah. Oh yeah. Then everyone was looking for hidden messages done backwards and stuff. And they're yeah. just like, listen to this. This is demonic. It's like, well yeah. It's a, pe- a speech pattern played backwards. It's like, yeah. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> Did you think it was gonna be like? Now you're playing the backward of this record. Good Great job. And go to bed at eight. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, the, the amazing thing about him too is I think he uh, had a photographic memory because. Uh, the day after the Beatles released Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band, he played it live on stage. Fuck yeah. Just, yeah, and I, I think Paul McCartney and John Lennon were both in the audience like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> you know? But just, oh, my, no one will ever reach the technical limits of what that guy did. And the fact that he could take other people's songs all along the Watchtower. That's a Bob Dylan song. But Bob Dylan said that's not his song. That's Jimi Hendrix. That's yeah. Yeah. That was a good song. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. He did another one, uh, another Dylan tune, a really, really popular one. Um, damn it. I'll remember. Mm-hmm. It's uh, So a couple of things about his technical ability. Mm-hmm. Part of what made Jimi Hendrix good was, yeah, that flamboyant nature. He knew how to like tap into what he wanted to hear and then he could elaborate on it. Mm-hmm. That's what was so great. That's what, I mean, some of those songs and you hear, you go, oh yeah, you're just listening, listening to him cut loose for a second. And it's not necessarily the most technically proficient. He's kind of just taking a walk out in space, doing some weird stuff and trying some weird effects and then they make it on the record. The only person I feel like who has ever done Jimi Hendrix any justice was Stevie Ray Vaughan. Yep. Un-fucking believable. And also, like, without Stevie Ray Vaughan, we wouldn't have a John Mayer. Mm. Flat out. For sure. Mm-hmm. We wouldn't, because, like, Stevie Ray Vaughan, like, had a similar story to uh, Eddie Van Halen. Both had very abusive fathers. They took solace in playing music religiously. Uh, and, like, Eddie Van Halen has, like, those classic stories about, I mean, not classic, but thing, like, the, oh, it was so great. Horrifying tales about, like, you know, he was so, sh- like, scared all the time, hiding in a closet, and, like, he would say for, like, 12 hours a day, he was just sitting there just playing guitar, and he was just, he was just afraid all the time. Um, but Stevie Ray Vaughan, I mean, he he's the younger brother of Jimmy Vaughan from uh, the Fabulous Thunderbirds. They're already a big band in Texas, uh, they travel around the Delta, and they're really, really well known. Stevie Ray Vaughan starts playing guitar, and he's very good. Jimmy, his older brother, tells it like he went on tour for like a couple of weeks, came back, and his brother was better than him. <laughs> he he figured out how to do something, but he was in love with Jimmy Hendrix. He was in love with this free spirit, where he was in you know he was in the South playing blues. You're not super free. You have to stay kind of within the confines. Yeah. So how do you kind of wiggle loose of that and, like, find your own ground? I mean, and he was dressed in fucking wild. He always had a fucking hat, feather, and, like, big fucking, like, crazy outfits sometimes. A Texas pimp, yeah. Yeah. He basically looked like a Texas pimp slash used car steal- dealer. Like, <laughs> <laughs> crazy Eddie's used cars. But this dude was nuts, though, because he's, like, throwing the guitar behind his back doing this shit and like his guitar tone people are like how the fuck do you do that like this is nuts and he was one of the only people like when you hear him do Stevie Ray Vaughan you feel like something emotional is happening Mm. like you like he does his version of Little Wing is like moving yeah because you can tell he's like I'm dedicating this moment to the single most influential musician in my life and that's Jimmy Anders and I know that I, musicians have this long standing you know you must not cover Jimi Hendrix yeah oh. yeah so because you fuck him up <laughs> that's yeah. the thing I mean there's so 
nuance that you have Special. to really play it right. Otherwise, yeah, you're really going to fuck it up, which makes Stevie Ray, Ray Vaughan that much better. Oh, yeah. John Mayer's cover of uh, Bold as Love. Fantastic. Uh, That's fantastic. He, he did a really, really, yeah. really good job. And let's not forget uh, Let's Dance, David Bowie. Stevie Great. Ray Vaughan guitar still on that song, yeah. Man, okay, well, so do you know that story about Bowie and Stevie Ray Vaughan? Okay, so where are they? Is it in Monterey? There's uh, no, no, no. It's like either Sweden or Switzerland. Um, Steve Ray Vaughan is is uh, on tour. He's playing the blues, and it's just him and his trio. Um, and they get booed. And the only person in the audience that is like shocked by that, David Bowie's in the audience. So he approaches him. And he's like. Don't worry about all this. He's like, I got a job for you. And he plays on uh, Let's Dance. And you're like, nice. Goes back. They they recorded a, a really classic, like two of the most classic concerts from C. Ray Vaughan you can look up are like his last Austin City Limits before he died. Uh, any of them are really good, but the very last one, he's sweating bullets high off coke out of his fucking mind and he doesn't even miss a note. You're just like, what in the hell? And then when he went back to Sweden, because he goes on stage and goes, you know, and people are just like, yeah, going nuts. He goes, you know, one year ago, you guys were booing me off stage. <laughs> and he just fucking tore their faces off nice. playing guitar. People were just like, oh, my God. Because that was the thing. Like, John Mayer uh, interviewed about Steve Ray Vaughan. He's like, you just have never heard somebody put their fingers to strings and make it sound like that. Mm-hmm. Like, just something happens. And, like, he based his whole guitar tone around uh, around Stevie Ray Vaughan, uh, both of their signature guitars are interesting because, like, the pickups on the uh, Stevie Ray Vaughan one are like trying to mimic ones that were kind of like made for him in the South, and they're okay. The ones on the John Mayer are so specific because he partnered with Fender and was like, "Yeah, this is kind of what I want. I want my strap to sound like not like a, not like everybody else's strap, not like something you can just buy off the wall." Mm-hmm. So yeah, anytime you got a John Mayer strap, fucking knew it. It was nice. awesome. It sounded great when you played it with your fingers, and it sounded great in the pick. And so that was like that neat thing, but it was also based on kind of almost like that that lineage. His is like a better version of the Stevie Ray Vaughan strap. <laughs> you know, it's like the, it's, I don't know. But yeah, so going back to Jimi Hendrix, the only person who could do Jimi Hendrix better than Jimi Hendrix was Stevie Ray Vaughan, but even then it was ma- mainly because it was such an homage to his idol. Um, but that's the thing, it's like G- uh, Jimi Hendrix is now just such an elementary part like a, of like rock and roll history. Then this happened. <laughs> it's like then, like the psychedelic era happened, and everybody started going, "Whoa, let's take a step back." <laughs> There's some great uh, shit going on. There's this war that's been going on forever. I don't like anything. Let's get high and talk about it. One of my favorite things about Hendrix, uh, because my dad, huge Hendrix fan, has a bunch of his uh, original vinyl and his. Uh, cover cover art was like the best unbelievable so fucking so awesome so funky so cool like uh, I actually just recently found out there was a, a soul song that I had never heard and I was like oh, I never heard this song called Mercy Mercy by Don Kobe mm. and I was like I showed it to my dad because I was like man we need to figure out who played guitar on this it's so fucking good it was Jimmy Anders <laughs> yeah there you go Fuck and it's yeah. just like one of these like very easy boom 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 but you know it's him though. I mean, it's that him. intro, it's like, it, you're like, oh, people look back then didn't play like that. Only one dude did. Yeah. Fucking Jimmy Hendrix. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so he told me that, I was like, I'm like, John Rapp. I was like, no, get out. He's like, no, look, there you go. Here's a little history of the recording of that song. The, the session musician and backup singer is fucking Jimmy Hendrix. And the, I always find it hilarious yeah. that when the Jimi Hendrix experience first toured America, they were the opening act for the Monkees. Yep. <laughs> so just, just it's There's like so Slayer bad. opening up for the Backstreet Boys. I mean, yeah. Yeah. it's just an odd pair. I mean, great music, both. I love the monkey. Sure, but it's, it's like yeah. it, it, imagine being management, and going, "Okay, Jimmy, check this out. <laughs> Fourteen. How would you guys like to open for the American watered down version of <laughs> The Beatles? <laughs> He's like groovy, baby. Whatever, you know. Like that's that's the thing. Like they, their management took them to England to get big, because in America it was just too wild. You know what I mean? Yeah, like Little Richard. No, I don't like all that. That's too much. You're doing too much. And so they're like, fuck this. Let's go to England. Like they they like everything. They like everything we do. 
And as soon as they get there, they're like, oh, my God, you guys are the best. Like, yeah. the Jimmy Hendrix experience, that's it? It's just three of you? Oh, my God. And then they came back here and were like, oh, yeah, I mean, cool. Like, we'll still play music. Yeah, we're opening for the monkeys. We're in England. Like, <laughs> we're celebrated. <laughs> I remember in the late 90s, they uh, re-edited uh, the movie, Wood- the documentary Woodstock. Um, oh, yeah. And added some extra footage into it, and we released it <clears> in theaters. And... There were two parts of that movie that really stuck out. About halfway through, they reinserted some footage of Janis Joplin singing that was not in the original movie, which seeing oh. on the big screen with surround sound, amazing. Yeah, but, but, um, but Jimi Hendrix. Oh, yeah. Wow. Oh, yeah. Wow. It's just like, it's electric. You watch him, and you're just like, oh, yeah. He's, you're just watching this dude just kind of like, I'm just going to... It's, Open up for a little while, and then I mean, it's away. like the music was in him, and he was using the guitar as a way to release it out. Because yes. you know, just watching him play the Star Spangled Banner of all things, oh, just yeah. how he's you know into that playing, you know, it, making the sounds of and just yeah. all the sound effects he had from that with at the time equipment that shouldn't be able to make that type of sound. Yeah, yeah, it was awesome, but. Yeah, that's my number three. All right. Right. Yay. Wait. Okay, so before I get into my, like, things, do you guys remember going to, like, Strawberries or, like, Sam Goody? Sam Goody. That, like, a East Coast thing? Yeah. I went to Sam Goody. No, back okay. in Michigan, yeah, yeah. we only had a place called Believe in Music that um, I, you know, ended up working at for a while, but the owners were complete assholes. Oh, yeah. I remember, like, in Boston... Going to like strawberry. You even said it in Boston. <laughs> Boston. I miss it. Except in Boston, it was, it was a wicked smart store. <laughs> but like going to Sam Goody and like getting these albums and tearing out the little leaflets from the books and like putting them in your binder and like you know people knew kind of like what music you were into by like the little booklets. Yes. Mm-hmm. It was a special feeling. Or when exactly. you get like a little sticker or a special thing, you're like, yes. this thing had a thing inside. <laughs> Did your thing have the thing inside? <laughs> So one of my bands that I'm going to mention later, but like I stole like the little loose discs that were in like the AMP and like rock magazines, like that yeah. came with like little samplers. I would oh, always yeah. steal those. Yeah, the alternative press stuff. Exactly. Yeah. And, like that's how I found out about the majority of like the rock bands that I'm into is because of those like little samplers. I miss that. I feel like we should bring it back, but whatever. Anyways, I'm going to take a break from talking about rock music and the next two artists that I was really huge on when I was like in middle school to like elementary school was Aaliyah and Missy Elliott. Oh, yeah. oh, yeah. <laughs> Especially Missy Elliott. Missy Elliott was like awesome. uh, yeah, amazing. Ah. Like that video for um The Rain. Dude. With <laughs> I think that's one where she wears a garbage bag, but yep, like that big garbage bag. Exactly. <laughs> I remember watching that music video and I was just like, holy shit, she's a fucking badass. Like, I love Missy Elliott. And then with her, she was really, really good friends with Aaliyah. And I remember listening to the song Try Again from I think that was in Romeo Must Die when that was the movie she was oh, in. Yeah. Yeah. With Jet Li. Um, right? Yep, yeah, with Jet Li. And then also uh, More Than a Woman. Those songs, like, Aaliyah is just, hands down, my one of my favorite R&B artists. Like, this is when Beyonce was getting, like, popular, but she was, I feel like she was, like, a little bit more popular at the time. She was still Destiny's Child. Yeah, because yeah. she was still with Destiny's Child. I, I will say, with, with Destiny's Child, it, when I worked at Believe in Music, they, they played Say My Name on a loop, and I just yes. <laughs> tried to smash it. Say My Name, say, shut up! That song? That's so overplayed. Oh my god. It's like that Usher song. Eh, 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 yeah. Eh, eh, they had that at Best Buy. Yeah. Stop. I remember that song at like middle school dances and everyone just like dancing. I was in high school and somebody had like a whole dance routine at one of our talent shows and I mean he went for it. He did the whole song. Wow. Uh, like he had his shirt off and like he was cut. <laughs> And girls were like, oh, my God. And, like, all the, like, gay guys in school were like, oh, my God. You're looking at the wrong guy. Like, <laughs> He's looking at us. We're looking at him. This is for all of us. <laughs> <laughs> nice try. And, wow. I mean, and it was like, he, he did all these amazing moves and all this shit. But, yeah, like, 
it was it was to that song because I was like, no, who's gonna come out and do the Luna part? And like looking around, and one of his friends came out and was like a goofy ass friend of his, and I was just like, man, you didn't even dress up for this event. Your friends out here like cut, look like you're rubbing stuff down in butter, like doing fucking Usher. It was awesome. I will say, like the late '90s, early 2000s was like the glory glory years for hip hop. Mm-hmm. And like rap music, at least I think For because sure. you had and the chronic, you, yeah, you had like Ludacris, you had Missy Elliott, you had um, Lil John and like his, yes. <laughs> but then you had like Nelly and stuff like that. So you had like a whole range of just like different. T. Artists, I. yeah, Ti. Mm-hmm. Like you had a whole range of different artists that were like coming out and doing these really cool things. I was trying to like low key be like that brooding like goth kid in high school, but like I or in middle school, but I still would like listen to like hip hop and R and B and just be like, no, I don't like this stuff. But Aaliyah, hands down, I would always just like stand for her because like she is amazing. Her voice is beautiful. I cried beautiful. when she died. Yeah, that was I was a mess. Tragic. Yeah, I was a mess, and I still cannot w- watch the video for Rock the Boat because that was the last video that she did before she died. What I would love to find out would be how many people named their kids Aaliyah after she died. I know, I know of at least five people that have been yeah. so. Probably a lot because she was just she was influential. so influential. And she like, was like a good person. Yep. <laughs> a dedicated artist yep. who made good music. Like, so it's hard not to like. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like that's why I feel like that's one of those things is people always forget one of those things. Yeah. <laughs> and like, she was. Oh, you're really telling you're a huge piece of shit, though. <laughs> <laughs> and she was a good actress, too. Like, yeah. she was breaking out into roles like. Was she in Queen of the Dam? Yeah, yeah, she yeah, was. Right. And that is my all time favorite vampire movie. Like, yeah. I fucking love that movie so much. Even though it was, like, kind of corny. But like, well, Anne Rice, Anne, Anne Rice uh, wrote the story that that movie was based on. Anne Rice has gone on record saying she hated that movie, but yeah. thought Leah was. Was, you know, one yeah, because yeah. she was really, really good, and yeah. she was freaking gorgeous in that movie. Yeah. Oh my well, god. Doesn't she play some like high vampire goddess? Thing? She's like the OG vampire. Yeah. She's like all the other vampires, like mother. And she like came into the bar. Like I remember the scene where she comes in the bar and like she's listening to the stat on the TV. Yeah. And like the other vampires are just like, "Who's this bitch?" Like, yeah. <laughs> whatever. Like. I'm gonna try and eat you like after this and she just like looks at them and starts like flaming them like they yeah. all just bust out like spontaneous combustion with like her hand and yeah. I was just like uh, she is a boss like she is a fucking queen like, I love her wine. exactly I was just like <laughs> let me play this movie one more time <laughs> Did you just? Yes, she just ignited them. <laughs> but like I remember after her passing I was like super bummed out about it but Missy Elliott like kept her alive because like she did like a tribute in like one of her songs to uh-huh. like Aaliyah, but Missy Elliott is another artist that I literally yeah she's amazing and I feel like she doesn't get the praise that she deserves no because she's not in mainstream like yeah in, in that OG community of of rappers she's still heavily. Uh, respected and she's mm-hmm. still active. Exactly, yeah. Like, she's awesome. I remember when she came back, I forget what song she came back to, but it was a really, really good song that, like, I still was just like, oh my god, she still has it. Like, <laughs> she's not going away anytime she's soon. Back. She's <laughs> back, yay! <laughs> but yeah, I have to mention those two artists. Yeah. Okay. Hell yeah. I like Queen of the Damned. That was awesome. Mm-hmm. Now our Slosh Ball MVP. What's your next choice? Uh, slosh. <laughs> slosh Ball. <laughs> Uh, I, I'll, I'll keep it around the same era. Uh, I was really big into Beastie Boys, uh, yes. and also uh, right around the same time where I was finding the Beastie Boys, Eminem was like coming out. Yeah, and it, it's very funny because you see these very two different styles of like hip hop and rap, where you have the Beastie Boys who kind of like rap with the flow and then you have Eminem who makes his flow with the rap yep. and um, some of the, the fastest rapping I've ever seen was with Eminem oh yeah uh, but I loved fucking loved the Beastie Boys growing up because you had like Brass Monkey so what you want like, oh god it's time to get song. ill get it together oh god and and uh, they were I forget their original group name but they they kept just getting shot down until they made like the Beastie Boys and well they started off as a punk band yep. in, in uh, New York. the very early eighties in New York um, they were uh, you know. 
they worked along with people like uh, Bad Religion, other other bands like that. And um, you know, that's when hip hop in New York was first starting to hit it big, and they you know started experimenting with that, and you know ended up meeting um, what's his name, Is it Rick Russell, Rubin? Russell Simmons and Rick Rubin. Yeah, and you know, history was made at that time. Now, initially, I think they would be the first to admit that that you know they did go a little overboard in trying to pretend to be too. Hip hop, I guess they, they they were not they they went the vanilla ice route. Yeah. I thought they were a parody group when I first heard them. Yeah, a lot of people do. Yeah, yeah it wasn't until they met up with the Dust Brothers with uh, Paul's Boutique um, that they really started kind of becoming their own. You know, yeah. kind of doing what you know what we talked about earlier with the Rolling Stones, taking that influence and just making that music their own. And then the album after that, I forgot uh, where. Um, what you, so what you want was on I forget the name of it but uh, that was the one that really hit it big that these guys are actual legitimate artists and not just goofy one hit wonders right. I don't know if you guys have watched the hip hop revolution evolution or oh, yeah. something the documentary okay. on Netflix yeah. that actually I had no idea about like how funk basically evolved yeah. into, into rap. the MC. And yeah, Max, and yeah. they were like Fuck, talking yeah. about Africa Bombada and like mm-hmm. artists like that and how it like evolved into this. It's the just Zulu so Nation. weird. Yeah, to see like Africa Bombada and like Zulu Nation, they like went from wearing these like leotards and like started like doing this weird kind of like experimental hip hop to like now it's like chains and like baggy pants <laughs> like, you, had people, just, you had people like Wu-Tang Clan who basically made gangster rap very gangster and very right. real these were killers and robbers and friends that like the RZA is is uh, the one that's championed by bringing them all together because mm-hmm. he was the producer um, but that was the thing because I mean Enter the 36 Chambers is still one of those albums even when I hear it now, like, because it's so rough, it's not super high production, but it's so hard. It's so hard. Yeah. Like, those dudes just, that's all they did. They were just like, that's the beat, give me this microphone. They just fucking wrap their ass off. Yeah. yeah. They're just like, whoa. <laughs> There's a good album out there. It's a soundtrack to the movie Ghost Dog um, with Forrest Whitaker Ooh, starring. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. The Rizzo was the producer on that, and the right. soundtrack is one of, it blew my mind. I, I'd, never heard, I'd never heard I'd never heard Wu-Tang before that. Yep. And, and just hearing that, it's like, oh, fuck, this yeah. is amazing. Um, but, the, the, you know, the Beastie Boys put out some amazing stuff. I mean, what song yeah. would you say hooked you? Oh, be, uh, Brass Monkey. Brass Monkey, Brass, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, you don't know what it's about, and then it's just like, walk up to the girl, put the glass down. You know, like, and it, it, it just <laughs> has, like, a really good flow. It's really hard, and then, like... Well, it hits, like, like, that 80s rap. Like, so you can see somebody, like, walking up to you, like, put the glass down. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, yeah, you stop and pose. <laughs> Put your left leg down, your right leg up. <laughs> what is this, Twister? Come on. Oh, my God. But but then, like, you, you go into that, and then you cut into uh, Eminem. Mm-hmm. Because Eminem took more uh, cut into, like, the gangster rap scene. Yeah. Uh, even though he was he was white, like, because you had groups like and the Beastie Boys. problematic. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And you had groups like the Beastie Boys, who, like, most people thought were parody. And then you have this guy who's like, I'm going to rap about killing my ex-wife. And then yeah. you're just like, whoa. whoa. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> and then it's like... Yeah, I mean, you know, Eminem today, you know, his first couple albums are, are absolute classics. And yeah. it did take me a while to understand him because the first song I heard was, you know, you know, the My Name Is, and I just, I thought it was goofy and stupid. Yeah, but, yep. you know, I mean, yeah I was at a friend's house and, uh, you know, we're smoking a little bit of weed. Um, and, you know, I heard the song Rock Bottom. Yeah. And that's when I really started understanding where he was coming from and then, you know, did a bit of a deeper dive. But to your point, though, I don't think Eminem really took the gangster rap mentality. I think no. he enjoyed the music and obviously yeah. with Dr. Dre as an influence, yeah. sound-wise, it's going to be, um, you, know, uh, the, the, you know, the same as, as some of that. But he was able to take elements he liked from that totally. and made it his own, I yeah. guess. Yeah. It took me a while because that was the thing, like, I can appreciate aspects of Eminem and for a while I called myself a fan, but, like, I really got turned off by, like, just the hyper-violent 
uh, content in it a lot. Yeah. And I would, I would just be like, yeah, okay. Like, and, but he, that, yeah, that's the other thing. That's not the entire basis of his material. That's yeah. why, like, the Marshall Mathers LP took me a second because, like, all my friends are listening to it. And it was, like, one of those analytical, like, okay, well, you know, like, let's see why my punk friends are listening to, you know, Eminem. And part of it, I think, was just, like, the shock value. Part of it was, uh, just like the how popular it was everyone wanted to know like what's the hype about yeah um so like he he is very talented um but he's one of those people that yeah I quickly kind of like so I like what he does or I respect what he does but it's like eh, I just kind of lost interest after a minute because I I would say for me it's uh, to your point I would much rather somebody take those feelings of anger that can build up in any relationship and express them in an artistic way instead yes. of in any other way yeah. right but when it's the same thing over and over right. again uh, you know it, to me there has to be some you know change in terms of you know what an artist is is singing about, and right. you know I, for, for me, I, I guess that's why I kind of petered off in in terms of my interest in listening to Eminem. But. I kind of liked his like later stuff, like as he was getting older, and yeah, like Relapse for example, like yeah. yeah, I think Curtain it was call. on yeah. Relapse or Curtain Call, but like the song Curtain Toy call. Soldier, like yeah. after his mm. friend passed away, where he was like actually you know rapping about stuff that was like close to him, yeah, real things, but like in a respectful way. I was just like, okay, this is nice. And then he completely switched and, like, started talking about killing his wife again or, like, some shit like that. Like, yeah. he just said something super problematic because he would always use the F word and, like, was very derogatory yeah. towards, like... I don't have to rap to sell... Or I don't have to cuss to sell records. Yeah. yeah. Or yeah. Will Smith doesn't have to cuss to sell records. But yeah. I do, so fuck yeah. you. Yeah. 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 yeah, like, he would say, like, derogatory things towards, like, the gay community, and that's yeah. when I was kind of just like, you know what, like, you're kind of, like, not shit, so yeah. I'm good on listening to you. Like, recently, during this whole feud that he has with Machine Gun Kelly, Machine is that Gun his Kelly. name? He, like, called Tyler, the creator, uh, the F word, yeah. and I was just like, you're, like, almost 50 years old, and you're still kind of, yeah. like, rapping as if you're, like, in your 20s, dude. Like, grow the fuck up. And like, should a 50-year-old release a diss track? Exactly. I'm just like, what are you doing? Yeah, I think that's like, an even better point. Like, it, 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 there's the thing. It's like, if if what you're trying to prove is that you're better than Machine Gun Kelly, okay, like, you can release a viral video, and that's a good way to look relevant still. You could also take the Jay-Z route. Anytime Kanye says something really fucking dumb about Jay-Z, Jay-Z says nothing. Yep. Because he just goes, no, nah, I'm not going to suffer that bullshit. Yep. Or you can do with the Rolling Stones. And then it blows over anyway, and they're friends again. You exactly. can do with the Rolling Stones did in the late 70s, because punk was popular at that time, and a lot of those artists were trashing, you know, traditional artists left and right. And, right. You know, the Stones didn't come out with a punkish shit album. They came out with one of their best work. They thought, they, they took it as a challenge of, right. let's show people why we're fucking amazing. Yeah. yeah. Why were the sure. Rolling fucking Stones? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. I don't know. Uh, that's, yeah, it's, it's one of those things, like... Uh, that, yeah, I think that's a, those are two really good points. Do you really put someone down like that, like you did when you were a child, as a 50-year-old? And then do you really release a diss track as a 50-year-old? That, to me, was, like, as sad as uh, Q-Tip last year when he didn't win Album of the Year. It, it, it blew my mind because it's like, yeah, I know you released a track called Quest Record. Yes, I know it's very, very important to hip-hop culture. He felt entitled to win an award because his best friend died. I think that's the wrong reason Ooh, to yeah. want to win. Hmm. And then he posted a viral video going nuts about how fucking corrupt, you know, all those dudes were, and you don't even understand what this record was. And it's like, yeah, it was a mediocre album. <laughs> this is just my take on it. I thought it was mediocre. It's it's it, it's okay. Like it's a tribe album, but it's not the heyday tribe that everybody loves. Yeah. Sorry. Even if it was the best in the world, uh, take some bands that are constantly ignored uh, by the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. Nine Inch Nails, Judas Priest, right. Deep Purple. I mean, yeah, you don't have on. to be a Deep Purple fan, but Smoke on the Water, dun, dun, come on, dun, that's that's rock and roll right there, and they have been routinely ignored. Does that make them any, does that make them bad? Of course not. No. You don't need an accolade to be, uh, like, no, they're doing what they yeah. should be, which is mm -hmm. playing music. <laughs> I mean, like, Imagine that. Yeah, yeah <laughs> exactly. It's like, don't release a diss track, like, uh, release a diss album. Yeah. Make the best sure. album that you've made since people were like, whoa, who is this guy? But instead, I you keep making the same stuff, like, that's just meh. Yeah. So I gotta use the restroom. Ooh, 
great time. I drink too much. <laughs> Get the beer shits. We needed that on the show. <laughs> <laughs> like, mm, we're still recording. <laughs> well, yeah, he's aware. And with that, another episode of Friends Talking Nerdy is in the books. We thank you all for listening. This is Tim Jasma. Remember to tune in next week as we continue our discussion on all things music with our special guest, Crosby Neal. Uh, remember to search out uh, Cros's album, the album he made under the name of Odar Beats. Uh, the album's called So Long, Take Care which, of course, is available on all available streaming platforms. Um, I primarily use Google Play Music myself and was able to find the album on there. You can find it on Apple Music, uh, Spotify, and other places. So we definitely, again, recommend you uh, check out Odar Beats' So Long, Take Care album. For this week's charity focus, we ask that uh, you head to PCRF.net. That's the website for the Palestine Children's Relief Fund. Uh, From their website, the holiday season is a special time of year for many of us, but for hundreds of families in the West Bank with children battling cancer while living under military occupation, ensuring their access to adequate care and services is a humanitarian duty. Your tax-deductible donation will ensure that children with cancer in Palestine have access to care and services that are otherwise not available to them. We hope you'll be generous and support this campaign. Um, all of your friends here are friends talking already do uh, highly encourage you to head to their website uh, and help them out in any way that they can. The world is a crazy place and more often than not some of the victims that are punished the most for just being in the wrong place at the wrong time are children. So uh, anything we can do uh, to you know, help children in need, uh, the better. So again, head to PCRF.net to help this uh, wonderful charity out. Uh, once again, next week is going to be part three of our discussion with music. Um, bringing back, a uh, Cros Neal, uh, Mr. Odar beats himself, uh, to continue that discussion. So, uh, from there, we will see you then in the meantime, let's hear another track off of, uh, Odar beats album. This is a track called Caffeine Drip. Subscribe to Friends Talking Nerdy on iTunes, the Google Play Music Store, as well as Spotify. Remember to support Friends Talking Nerdy on Patreon. Goodbye, darling.